friends, colleagues, thank you for having me here today. My name is Joshua Simmons, and I'm a senior open source strategist at Salesforce and president of the Open Source Initiative, the nonprofit that stewards the open source definition in the OSI approved license list. I go by Josh, my pronouns are he slash him, and I am speaking to you today from bucolic Petaluma, California, land of the Lekituit and Coast Miwok. I have had many different relationships with open source over the last 22 years. And over the last six years, I've had the great honor of working as a community manager in one form or another, serving the entire open source ecosystem. And in that time, I've developed some thoughts about the ecosystem's health and the threats that it faces. We face many challenges. Today, I'm here to speak to you primarily about one the pervasive lack of awareness about the open source ecosystem, most specifically its foundations. Modern software development wouldn't be possible but for the work of countless nonprofits. Yet we, the benefactors of their work, largely labor in blissful ignorance of this hidden infrastructure. I did for 15 years. You know, my career kicked off as a freelance web developer in which I was selling my services producing Drupal and WordPress powered websites. I used and benefited from free and open source software for about 15 years before I even realized that something special was happening. Like many, I took it for granted as a consumer and even as a creator. As open source continues to balloon and the burden placed on these nonprofits scales, our collective disregard presents an increasingly dire threat to the very things enabling this spectacular commons that is open source, our foundations. Today, I'm sharing this talk as a public service announcement. And we're gonna spend as much time as possible in the conversation in the Q&A. But what happens tomorrow is what's most important. Will you look to the future? Will you approach open source as a garden to be tended? Will you view financial support of open source foundations as charity or as an investment in our collective future and your ability to do business? Will you share what you've learned? Let's dive in with a little context, a brief history. Around 83, 85, we get the four freedoms in the Free Software Foundation. The original definition that was used to, uh, to analyze licenses, the original criteria to determine whether software was, an, was uh, free software or gave you, the user, software freedom. From the four freedoms, we got the Debian Free Software Guidelines. The DFSG was then used in 1998 to give us the open source definition, which is the originally nine point definition, now 10 point definition that the open source initiative uses to determine whether a license is open source or not. And then whether a project who uses that license is themselves open source by merit of that license. In the early 2000s, we saw a Cambrian explosion of open source enabled by predictable licensing and largely centered around shared hosting in the LAMP stack, Linux, Apache, MySQL, PHP. In order to provide stewardship for these open source technologies, organizations were spun up like the Python Software Foundation, the Apache Software Foundation, and the Drupal Association. Okay, so look, I started this with a vague building metaphor. Clearly I've already abandoned that in favor of the metaphor around ecosystems. It is so important to view open source and everything in it and around it as an ecosystem. Projects, maintainers, contributors, for profits and nonprofits, including trade associations and charities, hobbyists, students, professionals, entrepreneurs and investors. These are just a few of the stakeholders in the open source ecosystem. And every single one of them is both essential 
and come to the table with its own with their own motivations. We're all playing in the same space. We all occupy an essential niche. And we all have different incentives, motivations, and goals. Like an ecosystem, imbalance is a threat. When one component is too powerful or one component is under-resourced, the whole thing is in jeopardy. Much has been made of the subject of sustainability since 2014 in the wake of the Hartley vulnerability. We've seen a litany of research initiatives and events aimed at addressing what we call the sustainability problem. And while sustainability is absolutely an appropriate thing to discuss and explore, and of course it fits the ecosystem model, I worry we've spent too much time focusing on projects and not enough time on the organizations that make their work possible or on the evolving power dynamics. Look, just like sustainability is only one part of addressing the climate crisis, sustainability of open source projects is also only one part of addressing the issues we see in open source. So about those foundations, with a little bit of the scenery set, let's talk about them. First, let's talk about who they are. I'll just go over a few examples. There are lots of different types of foundations. First, standards organizations. You have OASIS and IEEE, who give us standards for communications protocols and document formats and things like that. You have the W3C as well, working in that space. Arguably, the open source initiative, OSI, is itself a standards organization, except it only has one standard and that's the open source definition. Standards organizations are one type of foundation. Then we have foundations that are primarily project hosts. You look at the Apache Software Foundation and the Python Software Foundation. Python is focused on the Python programming language and the ecosystem around it. And Apache Software Foundation is focused on delivering open source to the world with the Apache way. So we've got standards bodies, we've got project hosts, and then we have a few different permutations on those. For instance, we have the Eclipse Foundation and the Linux Foundation which are both trade associations and project hosts. I'll unpack what that means a little later. The last really distinct category of foundations that I think really stands out to me are the advocacy organizations. Um, for instance, Software Freedom Conservancy, which is a combination of advocacy on software freedom, user freedom, GPL compliance, as well as a project host of some of the world's most popular projects. Git, for example. So these are just the, the, the types of organizations that are out there in the foundation space. Now, what do they actually do? These organizations engage in advocacy work. These organizations provide fiscal sponsorship. They provide a home for these projects. When we have an open source project, when the project is first created, the copyright and all of the assets for that project are assigned to that project's creator. That creator might be an individual, that creator might be uh, an individual who's working at a company, in which case that company has all the rights and assets to, to that project. That's an okay way to start. There's no problem with that. But ultimately for a project to see massive adoption, we need to be able to trust that that project is in a neutral space and is gonna behave in a predictable fashion and that it, there is a place for us all to put shared resources for that project. So these foundations, they do advocacy work, but they provide fiscal sponsorship and that includes a bank account, access to an accountant, access to attorneys, you know, all of these administrative overhead that frankly, few if any open source projects wanna take on on their own. Better to rely on a foundation that is already expert in those things, already has those resources, and share those costs with other open source projects. We also have foundations that some, some also provide project infrastructure. Sometimes they even provide project governance. It varies. Speaking of, 
Let's talk a little bit more about how these different organizations vary. Yes, we talked about the different types. There are the standards bodies, the, the trade associations, the, uh, the fiscal sponsors, the advocacy orgs. And realistically, you look at any one organization, it's gonna be some combination of those things. There are a few other dimensions on which foundations vary that are important for us to be cognizant of. First of all, where is that organization incorporated? Every organization is officially incorporated in some geographic locale. Linux Australia, in Australia. The Open Source Initiative, Palo Alto here in California. Free Software Foundation Europe, Europe. The Eclipse Foundation is gonna be based out of Brussels pretty soon. This matters because this tells us both about the laws and rules that they are subject to and the way that they're going to operate, but this also tells us about the relationships that that foundation can bring to bear. It goes without saying, or it should go without saying, that Linux Australia is going to do a better job connecting a project with stakeholders in Australia than, say, the Linux Foundation itself would. So there's this geographic distribution. And then there's the corporate DNA. You know, what is the entity itself? And now I have not done, uh, I have not been involved with running organizations that are not based in the United States. So I don't have much of a view into what the options are in this elsewhere. But I will tell you at least a little bit about what, the, what that looks like here in the United States, because realistically, all of us have to contend with United States-based foundations in this work. So, in the United States, there are broadly two major categories uh, that the foundations fall into. We have the nonprofit charities. Sometimes you'll hear them referred to as 501c3s. And then we have the trade associations. And sometimes you'll hear them referred to as the 501c6s. It's so the archive reference to the IRS code under which they are organized. Don't need to remember those numbers. These two entities serve fundamentally different purposes. They may both serve as project hosts. They may both do some advocacy, but whereas a nonprofit charity cannot be a pay to play operation, where a nonprofit charity cannot engage in things like lobbying, that's exactly what a trade association is for. And so you look at organizations like Software Freedom Conservancy, which is a charity, is a nonprofit charity, they cannot be bought and paid for. With a trade association, those exist specifically to bring trades together in a space that is neutral, where they can collaborate and they can work together on advancing their shared interests. There's nothing wrong with that. They're, an, again, an essential part of the ecosystem, but they are fundamentally different. Now, often people like me will be heard trying to paint these two things and contrast them, the, the charities versus the trade associations. Truth be told, it's not black and white. The Eclipse Foundation behaves a little bit more like a nonprofit charity than say the Linux Foundation does, even though they're incorporated under the same rules. So though this is an important distinction, the, the charity versus trade association, it's most important for knowing sort of what the, the realm of possibilities are for that organization. It doesn't necessarily tell you a lot about what the organization actually does. So you need to look further to understand that. These foundations also vary on their mission. The Apache Software Foundation is a clear, plain and, well, I won't call it plain and simple, but it is a clear fiscal sponsor for open source projects and advocating for the Apache way. That is what it is very, very good at doing. You look at the Software Freedom Conservancy, yes, they're a fiscal sponsor. They provide a home for projects and they do that very effectively. I should know I'm, I'm a member of one of their projects, North Bay Python. But Software Freedom Conservancy has a mission around user freedom. And so they only accept projects that align with that licensing and align with those goals. So the missions vary. 
you've got Conservancy focused on user freedom. You've got the Python Software Foundation focused on Python, the Drupal Association focused on Drupal. Those things vary from one, from one to the next. Another way in which these organizations vary is the way that they are governed. First, the organization itself. Some have elected boards, some have appointed boards, some have boards where you can pay to get a board seat, some don't. There's also the governance of, at the project level. Some foundations ask, uh, have opinions about how the projects that they steward should be run. For instance, with North Bay Python and Software Freedom Conservancy, they have some specific, specific rules and bylaws that we need to abide by in order to stay in good standing as a, as a member project. For instance, as a member of the project committee for the North Bay Python under Software Freedom Conservancy, there can only be at most you know, 20% of any one company uh, or employer represented in the project management committee. And that just ensures that there's some neutrality around the way that the project is run. But not every foundation is so opinionated about how projects run. Some of them take a very light touch and they just let the project define that for themselves. And there's room for both of these. Some projects need that, that extra, uh, there's an extra opinionated governance, some don't. The last two ways that I see foundations really varying from one to the next is the level of support that they get and the funding mechanisms that they have access to. Broadly speaking, every foundation has sponsors and most foundations have some form of individual membership. Individual, the, the, the proportion of those things varies from one organization to the next. But by and large, it's corporate under sponsorship that is underwriting uh, the majority of their budgets. However, that can take different forms. If you look at the, if you look at the Python Software Foundation, they run PyCon US every year as a profit generating machine for the nonprofit that they can then reinvest in giving out hundreds of thousands of grants every year to encourage the growth and development of the Python ecosystem. It's important to recognize how they're funded because this sometimes can tell you a little bit about wh where they need help or when they are at risk. So for instance, when, the Pi when PyCon US was canceled because of the, the pandemic, that presents a very real threat to that organization. Whereas for others, the event might not be such a big deal. So we've talked about the types of foundations. We've talked about what they do. We've talked a little bit about how they vary. Let me briefly share why they matter. Without foundations, there is no body to convene disparate stakeholders around shared interests. There's no vendor neutral territory. There's no one to level that playing field. Open source would be less predictable, less stable, and more prone to gaming by well-resourced interests, absent foundations. Okay, we talked a little bit about the setting, how we got to where we are, who those foundations are, what they do, why they matter. I opened this presentation with a note of concern. I may sound concerned, should you be concerned? Or am I just an alarmist full of hot air? Let me share some of the concerns that I see. My first cause for concern. The Linux Foundation is very good at what they do and they fill a vital niche in our ecosystem. But it's not exactly a secret that they are the 800 pound gorilla in the foundation space. The Linux Foundation has a way of sucking all of the air out of the room and has a poor record when it comes to supporting and shining a light on the rest of the ecosystem, which is substantial. Increasingly, I view the Linux Foundation as a risky single point of failure. And unless they change tack, I think their approach will not only weaken our ecosystem, but it'll diminish the very things that have made them successful to everyone's detriment. But I'm hopeful though. 
there are wonderful people within the Linux Foundation who recognize this issue, who I've spoken to personally about it, and they've been receptive to that feedback. Let's see what they do with it. There's another 800 pound gorilla. Again, a vital part of the, e the ecosystem, for-profit companies. Look, I've spent a lot of time on this subject through my talks on open source citizenship, and many, many others are carrying that torch. So I'll keep this bit short. Many companies have gotten far better about investing in the open source ecosystem, but we have a long way to go. I met a director of open source a couple of years ago who didn't even know what the open source definition was, which to be fair, isn't as much an indictment of OSI's own outreach as it is of corporate open source. But it points to a problem. We need companies to not only be aware of the foundations, aware of the space in which they're operating in, but we need them to view investing in a diversity of open source projects and foundations as a necessary, can you use that word again, investment and get beyond this notion of open source as charity. Open source fared well in the last economic downturn, but it was a fraction of its current size and far fewer people and organizations relied on it in the same way that they do now. The economic downturn, the inability to hold events like PyCon or DrupalCon is a huge threat to the financial health of the organizations that steward the technologies we know and love. So though budgets are tight at for-profits who benefit from open source, the situation is even more dire in the nonprofit space that we rely on. This one, this one hits close to home given my role at the Open Source Initiative. Some like to say, we are in a post open source world. I disagree. We are here for a reason and that's open source, but that's their prerogative. I've dedicated plenty of time to this subject elsewhere, so I won't dwell on it here. But the too long didn't read TLDR is that the open source definition has always been tested from 98 all the way to present. And licensing evolved for many reasons, the pursuit of profit, moral pursuits, and changing technology. This has hit a fever pitch recently. Activists, venture capitalists, and some corners of established industry are fighting tooth and nail to redefine open source. OSI and the rest of the foundation ecosystem has been on the case, but we can't survive this alone. We need everyone to jump in. Because as that consensus around the meaning of open source deteriorates, the thing that we've come to know and love, the thing that we've come to rely on becomes more tenuous. Okay, we've set the scene. We've talked about who some of these foundations are, the different types of foundations. And we've talked about some of the risks that they're facing. What do we do about it? What can you do about these things? Become a member. Most of these organizations have an individual, if not also an organizational member program. The Open Source Initiative certainly does. Become a member of these organizations Sometimes there's a small fee attached, with, attached to it, but remember these are nonprofits, they could probably use that funding. Become a member of the foundations whose work you rely on. Sponsor the foundations, they need it now. They need it now more than ever. Volunteer. Many foundations rely on some level of volunteer label, labor, including board service. So get involved and just broadly participate. You respond to their surveys, participate in their mailing lists, forums, or working groups. Again, 
run for their board of directors. Get a job at a foundation. We need, we desperately need good talent in foundations. And many people never even consider foundations when they're on the job search. So put that in your back pocket and remember that next time. And then educate. Because the, the risks that I outlined, they're not going away. And in an environment in which we are broadly unaware of our foundations and just how reliant we are on them. In that environment, those risks that I outlined are far more threatening than they otherwise would be. If there was broad awareness of not just say the open source definition and the fact that it has a definition, but of the nonprofits on whose backs we build our careers and our companies, then no one's ever gonna know that there's a problem to be fixed in the first place. What happens tomorrow, now that you have some of this information is what's most important. Will you look to the future and approach open source as a garden to be tended? Will you view financial support of foundations as charity or as an investment in our collective future and your ability to do business. Will you share what you've learned? I hope so. Thank you. And I think now we have a little time for Q&A. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you. Folks, uh, feel free to use the chat feature uh, to drop questions if you have them. I'm also going to give you your 15 minute warning. Thank you. Ah, great question here. Uh, where do you recommend people look for open source foundation jobs? There are a couple places that I recommend. Uh, first, there's something called the uh, Floss Foundations mailing list. Um, this mailing list is, is basically a who's who of, of foundations. And when there are new jobs being posted at these foundations, often they'll be posted there. Uh, so I highly recommend checking out the, the Floss Foundation's mailing list. Uh, if you can't find that, my contact information is on the screen. Feel free to reach out. I'm happy to point you that direction. Uh, I also recommend uh, joining the to-do group Slack. Um, if you're okay using Slack, they have a jobs channel where often I'll see jobs, uh, not just for foundations, but also for you know, corporate open source. So you get a little bit of both there. Um, I will put in a plug uh, for the open source initiative, which next year is gonna be looking for to hire an executive director and a communications manager and a community manager. So if any one of those hats interests you, Stay tuned because there's going to be a job for you pretty soon. Oh, you folks are going too easy on me. Oh, there we go. Another question. Great. I'd like to learn more about the space. Is there a matrix survey directory, Wikipedia page, et cetera, that summarizes various open source foundations? Oh, you had better believe it. Let's see here. Let me see if I can find uh, the link on the fly here. If not, I'll be happy to share this after the fact. There has been a non-trivial amount of uh, research done in this space. So there's definitely resources that I recommend you check out. Um, 
Thank you. I will pick up that question in the Q&A momentarily, and I'm going to drop a handful of links. I really mean it, a handful, into the chat there. This is a great way to get a sense of where these other, who these other foundations are. Okay. Um, I am actually having trouble pulling up the Q&A window. Moderator, are you able to see the question in the q and I can. It says, with the creation of open source support groups, e.g. OSPOs, in academia and governments, how can those groups help these foundation issues? Mm. Thank you. I honestly, the first step is just working on awareness. You know, I think it's important that anytime we're talking about open source that we make sure that uh, foundations are a part of that discussion. Uh, you know, I, I actually really, some people get a little, uh, some people think the Apache Software Foundation is a little crunchy for, uh, for mandating that people refer to every project with Apache first. You know, it's the Apache web server, it's Apache Hadoop, it's not just Hadoop. But honestly, I think that's a very smart move on Apache's part because that means there's a greater awareness that there's this, uh, this body behind these projects. And I think we need to start doing that for all of these projects. No, I'm not saying we need to enforce the same branding guidelines, but we just need to make sure that the foundations are an explicit part of the conversations that we're having. Because if we're not continually drawing attention to them, there's just no way that we're gonna be able to, to have useful conversations about the, the problems that they're facing. Ah, another great question here. An observation I made is that we see the same group of people speaking at conferences and representing open source software. Many of them have involved, been involved for many years. How can we ensure to bring in new blood to the ecosystem to focus on these high level issues that you mentioned? I, I'm so glad you asked this because one of the things that I'm working on is uh, in, in my, my day job is a program called the Accidental Maintainer Program. And we're working on providing sort of next level guidance on issues that people who stumble into the role of maintainer may not have experience with, you know, community management, governance, succession planning. Because so often open source projects don't invest in that succession planning and they need to. The problem that we see in open source projects around that it's worse in foundations. It's absolutely worse in foundations. You know, I got into this as a web developer and it was so easy for me for years, for two decades to do my job and not even really know what open source was or that there were, you know, nonprofits supporting it. And not knowing those things means that there wasn't even an opportunity for me to get involved because I just didn't know that I was there. And so the same way that we've seen mentorship programs spin up around open source projects to bring in new contributors, the same way we see open source projects thinking about building new contributors guides, clarifying their governance and highlighting bright paths, uh, eliminating the way for people to get involved with the projects. We need to do the exact same thing for foundations. I would love to see a foundation mentorship program probably not going to happen, but I think that would be extremely valuable. I would love to see contribution guides for foundations. I think we need to raise awareness. We need to demystify these foundations. And then we need to impart upon, we need to impress upon people the critical role that these foundations serve and how important it is that they get involved with those foundations. Look, I'm gonna, I'm gonna speak selfishly for a moment. You know, I was first elected to the Open Source Initiative Board of Directors in 2016. I had only been consciously aware of open source at that point. 
for four years, just for four years. And so I got involved with the open source initiative. I ran for the board of directors. I got onto the board of directors and I've been on the board for four years. I'm in my fifth year now. And it has been great for my career. It's been great for my profile. I'm very grateful for it. But the challenge is that I am largely an anomaly. You know, I got into this because I served in a meta community manager kind of role. In a role in which I could see the superstructures uh, that power open source, that it was made easy and obvious to me through that work. If I had stayed as a web developer, I may have continued laboring without knowing these things for much longer. So, you know, I don't have all the answers, but we desperately, desperately need to work on outreach, on, on awareness, um, and mentorship and succession planning, because you're absolutely right. We see the usual suspects all the time, you know, even, even with OSI, you know, we've had people who served on the board for a decade or more. And while I'm grateful for their service, arguably that might be a sign that we're not, we don't have enough churn. We don't have enough new blood entering this space. So again, I don't have all the answers, but, but I, I, I strongly believe that awareness is the first step and then mentorship is the next thing that we really need to get into. We have another question here. Stumble is a good term that you used and you mentioned educate. So what are some good means to provide some guides and maybe even mentors or mentorship to help guide the next generation into the ecosystem? I'm, I'm so pleased to hear this question. One of the things that, uh, one of the things that we need to do is we need to make sure that information about open source and the way the ecosystem works is in curriculum. We need to make sure that it's part of the code boot camps. We need to make sure that it's a part of getting that CS degree or whatever it may be. Excuse me. We need to make sure that when people are being taught how to code, how to build software, that they're also being taught what that ecosystem looks like and why it's possible to do what they're doing. Because if we're not treating that information as, as sort of a, a, a first order concern in their education, they're gonna get into industry and they're just gonna be clueless. And sure, maybe they're productive and they can get their job done, but if they are not aware of these bigger issues, then they're going to perpetuate this status quo in which we're not adequately aware of foundations, we're not adequately supportive of foundations. So education is one piece of this. And I think go, getting, into, getting curriculum into boot camps and into universities uh, and other schools is a great first step. The uh, Open Source Initiative has partnered with uh, Brandeis University and I know the Linux Foundation has partnership with some educational institution and they're providing micro courses and certifications and other ways to, to share this information. So I think that's all very promising. Um, and I don't know where else we need to go, but broadly speaking, we need to meet people where they're at. Because for too long, we have relied on people discovering us and that doesn't scale. It's not working. Um, so, you know, we, we've, this is an area where we need to do a lot of, we need, need to do a lot of work to figure out where, where we need to go to, to meet these people. Another comment here, uh, the Drupal Association's licensing working group is now just three 45 plus year old white guys who all work at universities. I would love any ideas on how we can attract younger, more diverse members. Most people I talk to see licensing as a solved problem. Oh yes, this is, this is totally a thing. This industry looks way too much like me, white guys. And we know that tech industry has a diversity and representation problem. And honestly, the problem is 10 times worse in open source. Partially, 
because open source often requires free time and volunteerism, which is a filter, a proxy for privilege. You know, if I'm, if I'm raising children or if I'm taking care of my aging parents or I'm working two jobs, I am never gonna have the time to volunteer, to voluntarily contribute to open source. And so we see open source as even less diverse in the tech industry itself, which of course we know is bad. What we need to do, people who look like me need to take responsibility for creating space for people not like us. We need to make sure that we are investing in up and coming leaders who aren't like us. Because let me tell you, the next me is gonna do just fine. Just by merit of unconscious bias, the next white guy who comes along, they're gonna be fine. Like, yeah, they're gonna struggle and we should, we should help them along as well. But the barriers they're gonna encounter in getting involved in this space just don't even hold up a candle to the barriers faced by literally anybody else. And so we need to make space. We need to amplify underrepresented voices. Increasingly, that's what I do with my social media. I try to, broad, I try to say less now and instead focus on amplifying other people whose profiles we need to elevate and who are the next generation of leaders. We need to make space, we need to amplify. We also need to make sure that we're building welcoming communities in which they know that they're gonna be welcomed. Yes, we hey, need a code of conduct. Yes. Just letting you know, you have three minutes left. I was waiting to give you your five okay. minute warning, but you know. Yeah, tough to get an, a, 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 an Edward in with me. Thank you for that. Uh, yes, we need codes of conduct, but then we also need to know that the foundations have an enforcement mechanism to bear these out. You know, there are lots of things that we can do to bring in underrepresented people. Um, and I'll also, I'll, I'll give a shout out to the Outreachy pro Mentorship Program right now, which though it's focused on open source projects, I don't think there's any reason why an open source foundation couldn't treat itself as a project and specifically work through mentorship programs like that, that target women, non-binary people, trans folks, and other underrepresented groups in tech. So all this is to say is that my outreach, when I work on a conference or, or, or doing any form of outreach, I do the baseline outreach for the usual suspects, for where you're gonna find a lot of people who look like me. And then I spend the majority of my outreach effort on the underrepresented groups because they're the ones who need to know that they're gonna be valued and welcomed. And they're the ones who probably won't find you on their own. So I would just say, you know, 75% of our outreach efforts need to be focused on those underrepresented people. Um, and there are a lot of things that we can do to make sure that they know that they're welcome and that when they are joining the project that we provide them the support to rise throughout the ranks and the, the moral support to keep them around uh, because as I say, it's not just a pipeline problem, we have a retention problem. So I have, I think one minute left. I'm gonna briefly go through this. We have from Sean says, there's been a surge of newly approved OSI licenses in the past couple of years with explicit adaptations for patent law. This trend may extrapolate to customizations for trademark law and government regulation. Is expansive new licensing a good thing for open source software to be embraced as new markets embrace the OSD or an undertone that needs to be addressed by the open source software community? Ooh, this is too big for one minute, but I will say, Yes, it is both concerning and encouraging and an inevitable result of our success. We need to be vigilant. We need to be watchful for how we push the boundaries of open source. Open source definition is never above scrutiny. It should constantly be clarified and annotated and refined. But there are some things about it that are sacred and we need to make sure that as we experiment and evolve that we, we we mind those things so that the very essential ingredients that enable our commons are not undermined. So uh, it's, a, it's an inevitable product of, of our success. And I would say that vigilance is very much to be called for. And with that, I think I'm out of time. And thank you so much for everyone uh, for, for being here. I really appreciate your time and, and the excellent Q&A.
And thank you again to the to the moderator.